Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Existential Stoic Podcast. This is episode 48, and I am Danny. from my buddy Randy. And today we have a special guest, Massimo P- uh, Piliucci. <laughs> Have we pronounced that right? Um, and today we're going to be talking about his new book, A Field Guide. I don't know if you can see it on the camera. It's kind of hard. But A Field Guide to the Happy Life, 53 Brief Lessons for Living, where he kind of, I guess you could say, re-envisions the Enchiridion in an attempt to sort of update Stoicism. Um, is that accurate, I guess, depiction? Yeah, that, that, uh, uh, the book has two reasons, really, for, uh, for existing, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> One is, it's, I think that Epictetus needs to be uh, better known by the general public. You know, he was a household name ever since the second yeah. century, <laughs> basically, <laughs> and uh, all the way through the Middle Ages, because the Enchiridion was used by Christian monks as a training manual. It was known in the Renaissance, uh, and in fact, it was uh, translated by Poliziano uh, at the Medici's court uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Latin and from the Greek. Uh, so, and, and then even, even all the way to the 19th century, I mean, all of the American founding fathers had a copy of the Enchiridion, George Washington, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin. And then somehow during the 20th century, kind of, we kind of lost him. <laughs> like he's, yeah. he's receding in the background. And I think that needs to be corrected because Epictetus is one of the greatest philosophers ever, period, in the Western tradition, uh, regardless of whether you're interested in Stoicism or not. So that's one reason, uh, you know, so how do you bring Epictetus back to the attention of a general public? Well, one way is to represent these ideas in modern language using modern examples uh, and, and that's one of the, the two goals of that book. The other one, however, is, uh, as, you, as you say, uh, bringing Stoicism itself, particularly Epictetus' version of Stoicism, but uh, Stoicism as a philosophy, up to date with the 21st century. Because, uh, well, it's a philosophy that's two and a half millennia old almost. Yeah. And, you know, just in the same way in which nobody is a Buddhist or a Christian today, in, in, in the way in which people were Buddhist or Christian two millennia ago, I don't think it makes sense to say that we should be Stoics exactly in the way, you know, Epictetus or Seneca uh, were. So the second notion is to bring it. Now, this is not just my project. There are other people that have been involved in sort of updating Stoicism for the 21st century. I think most importantly, Larry Baker, who just died a few years ago, uh, his book, A New Stoicism, is arguably, in my mind at least, the best and most comprehensive attempt to uh, update Stoicism. The problem is it's a difficult book to read. It requires quite a bit of (laughs) background in philosophy. So, Well, that's always the struggle, right? It's finding that balance between, you know, being, you know, scholarly and, and have, having done the research and presenting an accurate picture, but also making it readable and accessible if you want to get a broader audience, which is one of the things philosophy struggles with, I think, all the time is making it sort of, you know, the information that it has available, <laughs> which is always. A yeah, problem. but if you think about it, philosophy is not unique in that respect, right? I mean, take any field yeah. in science and it's like, well, good luck yeah. understanding, <laughs> you know, really understanding quantum mechanics or, or even, in fact, evolutionary biology or molecular biology. The difference is that until recently, science, there were ma- many more scientists and science popularizers who were interested in writing for the general public. But I think this has actually changed uh, or, or is changing over the last decade or so in philosophy. There are a lot of, there's a number of freelance philosophers these days, you know, people like Julian Bagini or Nigel uh, Warburton who spend their entire life uh, basically writing for the general public and even professional philosophers uh, that are academics. Uh, have actually started getting more, paying more attention to the fact that, you know, you, you need to talk to the public, but you can't just uh, close yourself up in the, in the, the ivory tower, so to speak, and, uh, and do your thing. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, oh, go ahead. Gonna... Yeah, I was going to say one thing that I really enjoyed about your book, this field guide, was that these, you know, all of these tips were very short, they were very easy to understand, but at the same time, they were very actionable. So somebody could, you know, something you could look at every day, And you could say, oh, you know, I can implement this today. I can work on this today. And uh, it's just seemed very down to earth and very, you know, I could, I felt like I could relate with you because you seem like a human being as opposed (laughs) to someone who was like very intellectual and just trying to make me understand that you knew more than me. Thank you. That, that was exactly (laughs) the the idea. Uh, And of course, again, I, 
this is an homage to Epictetus. I mean, Epictetus reads that way. If you read the, if yeah. you read the yeah. discourses or the manual, he does read that. Of course, as we know, he actually didn't write anything down. This was an Arian of Nicomedia, one of his uh, students who actually wrote down this stuff, which kind of uh, in part, I think, um, explains why Epictetus comes across as so lively, especially in the discourses, because Arian didn't write down verbatim uh, lectures that Epictetus was doing. He wrote down dialogues with his students. So you get this notion, this, this yeah. really this feeling of, of dynamic. You know, it's like he's, he's talking to his students. Sometimes he's berating his students. Sometimes he's being sarcastic with his students. And sometimes he <laughs> says, you know, what the hell are you guys doing? Uh, there's one of my favorite bits in the discourses where he says, you know, you guys come in here and study stoicism, but when I, when I meet you outside, you all behave like Aristotelians. <laughs> <laughs> Taking the task on it. Yeah, I really liked it. And I really love, you know, I love the, the introductory material was enough, I think, to get people sort of going and on course to read the rest of it. I like the idea of having a handbook. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you think some of the what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions people have about Stoicism coming to it that you, you hope to address through works like this? Well, the big one uh, that often comes up is this notion that Stoicism is about going through life with a stiff upper lip and suppressing emotions. Basically, you know, Mr. Spock from Star Trek. And, yeah. uh, you know, with all due respect to Spock, who is my favorite character uh, in Star Trek, <laughs> nevertheless, you, you know, you, you, you don't, as a human being, you don't want to live that way. And in fact, sure enough, the Stoics don't actually say that we should live that way. Um, as in every misconception, there is a grain of truth. Uh, you know, the word Stoic, the modern English word Stoic with a little s does have something remotely to do with Stoicism with the capital S, meaning the philosophy. So the stiff upper lip, uh, you know, distortion comes out of the fact that the Stoics really do put emphasis on endurance. Right. If yeah. there is, if something is happening that is outside of your control, as Epictetus would put it, then what are your choices? You either throw a tantrum, uh, which is not a very, you know, adult thing to do, uh, <laughs> or you just uh, buckle up and, uh, and, and take it. It's like, it's not like you have a choice. So in that sense, there is an emphasis on, uh, in Stoicism on, on endurance. But the in issue of the emotion uh, stuff there is like, no, the Stoics don't actually say that we should suppress your emotions for one thing, because they are perfectly aware that it's not possible to suppress one's emotions. Yeah. Uh, just read Seneca's on anger, and he's very clear about this. Like, no, <laughs> you, you just can't do it. Now, what you do want to do, however, is to pay attention to the fact that there are, according to the Stoics at least, two major categories of emotions, what they call the unhealthy emotions, uh, the pate. And the, the, the root of that word is the same as the, the English word pathology. So that tells you it's not something good, right? <laughs> uh, and then the eupateiai, these are the healthy emotions. The analogy here is, I, I think one way to understand the difference between uh, healthy and unhealthy emotions is to think in terms of the body and of food that nourishes the body, right? So we all know that there is healthy food, uh, you know, uh, broccoli, for instance, you know, steam broccoli or something like that, right? Uh, you know, high fibers foods and stuff like that. And then there is unhealthy food, you know, French fries and, you know, the stuff like that. Now, it's, it's easier for us to go for the French fries than for the steamed broccoli. But we know that that's not good for us. If you do French fries all the time, you're, gonna ha you're not going to live long. You're going to have serious long-term uh, health problems. Similarly, with the emotions, the Stoics say that it's easier to go with, to indulge our unhealthy emotions, such as anger, hatred, fear, things like that. It just comes naturally. You just go with it, go, go with it. It's like, you know, it feels, even if it even feels good, just like a, a meal based on junk food, it really feels good, but it's not good for you and it's not good for other people. And so they, uh, their idea is that we should try to uh, modulate and, and come to terms with the unhealthy emotions as much as possible and actively, mindfully cultivate the healthy emotions, just like you would mindfully actively cultivate a healthy diet, right? You have to make choices. When you go to the supermarket, you're going to make a choice and you're going to stay away from the uh, ice cream and you're going to pick, you know, the vegetables and the fruits. And uh, it's the same idea with, with the emotions. Of course, the emotions, you can't just pick them. You have to cultivate them. You have to yeah. deal with them. Uh, but it's the same basic idea. And so the notion is not that we should suppress our 
emotions. The notion is that we should modulate our emotional spectrum to move us far away from destructive, unhealthy uh, emotional responses toward healthy ones. The unhealthy responses and emotional responses are actually defined very clearly by the Stoics because sometimes people ask, you know, so why is anger, let's say, an unhealthy emotion? Isn't it a little bit of anger a good thing? Because after all, it, it, yeah. uh, it gives you a little bit of a more uh, uh, incentive to act in a certain way, to react to injustice, let's say, things like that, right? That's the Aristotelian position. And, and Seneca makes fun of Aristotle in, on anger. He says that Aristotle, one of the Aristotle's arguments for why we should be a little bit angry, not too much, says Aristotle, but a little bit, as if you could control it. And that, in fact, that's the yeah. first thing that, that Seneca says, like, this guy is, is a fool if he thinks he can control anger. Once an anger is started, you're not going to control it. That's the, that's the stoic definition of an unhealthy emotion. It takes over reason. And so once you let it go, it's, there's, not, there's no stopping it. It's not controlling it. It's like it's foolish to try to control it. But um, Seneca says, so according to this Aristotle guy, uh, you know, one of the reasons uh, anger is good is because uh, if your soldiers, let's say, are prepared for battle and they're a little bit angry, uh, they're more willing to go into battle. And Seneca's response is, well, that may be true. Uh, but it's also true that your soldiers will be uh, more willing to go to battle if they are a little drunk. That doesn't mean that a drunken army is a good idea. It's just like, it's like it doesn't work that way. So, um, so that's about the treatment of, of the emotions. So I think that the stiff upper lip and the emotion suppression are, is one of the major misconceptions about stoicism. But there is a second one that I think is even more pernicious. Uh, not only because it's not true, but because it kind of, if, if taken seriously, it kind of undermines the whole of Stoic philosophy. So there is this common understanding, misunderstanding, I would argue, uh, among a lot of modern commentators that Stoicism is a quietest philosophy, meaning that it's a philosophy that uh, stays away from political and social involvement, that it's about you, you know, you cultivate yourself, it's about self-improvement, you cultivate yourself, it's about you, 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 basically, and not about other people, which is completely false. Yeah. It's totally <laughs> the opposite of what... Stoicism is really supposed. That's Epicureanism, actually. Epicurus, because he thought that the highest good in life is a life without pain, either physical or mental, he actually did counsel his students not to get involved socially and politically, because social and political involvement, as we all know, is painful. It's <laughs> it's emotionally it painful, stress. right? Yeah, it yeah. causes a lot of stress. Uh, but the Stoics were kind of the opposite. The, for the, Sto the Stoics were cosmopolitan. They were, they, they believed that every human being on earth is our brother and sister, and that we have a duty to be involved socially and politically. Seneca is very clear about this. The wise person has a duty to be involved politically as much as he can or she can. You know, at the high levels, at highest levels, if you're the president of the United States, uh, at a local level, if you are, you know, average Joe uh, or, or Jane, but it doesn't matter. You still have a duty to be involved socially. Uh, related to this is to this uh, notion of sort of Stoicism as being a quietist philosophy is this idea that, oh, well, but the Stoics are about enduring whatever happens to you, right? So Epictetus <laughs> says often, uh, you know, don't, don't wish for things to be different, just uh, um, accept and even embrace things the way they are. Well, if you take that in isolation, right, so just that little phrase, then sure, it sounds like he's saying, don't care about the rest of the yeah. world, you know, do your, just do your thing. But, but you cannot take a philosophy in isolation, just one little quote at a, at a time. And so in context, actually, what Epictetus is saying, Marcus Herodes is even more clear about this. He's saying, you need to endure whatever you cannot change, but you have a duty to change what you can yeah. Right. And, the, and modern critics forget the second part. Uh, sorry, uh, Marcus Rydis says has this beautiful uh, passage in the meditations where he says, don't wait for Plato's Republic on Earth, <laughs> meaning, you know, utopia, basically. Just do whatever little good you can make whatever little difference you can make, because that's important. That is that that does make a difference for other people. So so those, I think, in, in my mind, at least are the two major dis uh, misconceptions about stoicism so uh you mentioned they're doing what's in what's within your realm of control and you talk about that in the beginning of your book 
uh, noticing what's within your control and what's not within your control. And I notice nowadays there's kind of a very marketing based culture that we have, at least in the United States. And like the three evergreen areas that they have in there is health, wealth and relationships which are three things which are distinctly out of your control. So it's, it's almost like we have a society that's addicted to the things out of their control. How, what's kind of a practical way that somebody who can go from this self-help type of thing to actually transitioning to what's within their control? Yeah, that's a good question. The answer is uh, very simple in theory. In practice, it's very, it's very difficult. <laughs> Not always. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, that's the way it goes. And, and in fact... I would say that that's, that's true, not just for Stoicism, but for any other philosophy of life. You know, Stoicism is a demanding philosophy, but so is Christianity, so is Buddhism. You know, if you want to be a good Buddhist, it, it takes effort and, and, and it's a sustained effort throughout your life. So just yeah. because it's easy to understand, it doesn't mean it's, it's easy to practice, but that's the whole point. You need to practice it. So uh, the, the answer to your question is uh, very simple as far as the Stoics are concerned. And it lies into the dichotomy of control, what's sometimes called the dichotomy of control. I actually don't like that term because control is actually the wrong term here. Uh, because when you tell people that some things are under, are under your control and other things are not under your control, immediately somebody says, well, but there are things that are neither because I can influence <laughs> them. It's like, I know. But in yeah. fact, the things that you can influence it themselves turned out to be made of two components, the things under your control and the things that are not under your control. So the dichotomy still holds. But I prefer to refer to it as the stoic fork. That's, that's often the, the alternative um, way of putting it. And uh, in fact, Epictetus, in some translations, doesn't use the word control. It uses the word up to us. Right? So there are some things that are up to us and other things that are not up to us. In other, in other words, some things for which you can take responsibility the buck stops with you and other things for which the buck doesn't stop with you. The, the ultimate responsibility is not yours. And you're right, Renal, that all, all the externals are not up to yeah. us. <laughs> Again, we can influence them. Of course, I can take care of my health. Uh, of course, I can uh, you know, work on my career, on my reputation, on my relationships, all of those things. But work here just means apply good judgment to any particular situation that concerns those externals and then uh, decide on a course of action. Those things, you know, judgment and decisions to act or not to act are in fact up to me. No, nobody can say, do this or do that. I mean, they can say, but ultimately it is my decision whether to do something or not to do something. But the outcomes of my actions and my decisions and my judgments, those are not up to me because they depend on uh, external factors to some extent, right? So. Uh, my career depends not just on my efforts, but also on my colleagues, my competition, my boss, etc. My relationship obviously doesn't depend just on me, it depends on my wife uh, just as much. Uh, my health depends certainly in part of how much you know, good care I take on myself and how careful I am in the middle of a pandemic. But at the same time, uh, you know, bodies age and viruses strike, strike and you know, disease happens and there's, there's not much you can do about it. So the simple answer to the question of, you know, so in this society where we're obsessed with outcomes, what do we do? Well, we turn exactly the other way around. And the stoic advice there is to internalize your goals. So it comes natural to us, particularly because we live in the kind of society that we live, uh, to focus on outcomes. So you go for a job interview and you start worrying about whether you get the job or not you start dating somebody and you fall in love with that person and you start worrying about whether the relationship is going to work or not, whether she re he or she re reciprocates uh, and so on. You, you, you're worried about your reputation and so on and so forth. Right, but those are all outcomes. What you should be concerned with are the things that are up to you, which are your, your intentions and your actions, right? So in terms of my career, I should not concern myself with how well it goes. I should be concerned myself with how well I do, what my decisions are in terms of should I do this or should I do that? Should I try to you know, change jobs? How should I do my job? Those are all internal. Those are all my decisions, right? In terms of relationships, the same idea. I shouldn't be concerned about whether the other person likes me or loves me or whatever it is. That's up to them. I should be concerned about being a loving 
person, somebody who is reliable, somebody who is trustworthy, and so on and so forth. And then let the, the, the chips fall as, as where they may, as, as they say. Uh, now, this is easy to understand, as I said, difficult to practice, yeah. right? <laughs> um, which is why Epictetus says that every single thing you do, everyone, from the minor ones to the, to the big ones, every day, you should always ask yourself, about this, what is up to me and what is not up to me? And in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, I wrote a, a book with my friend Greg Lopez called A Handbook for New Stoics, which is entirely made of exercises, basically. Hmm. And the very first exercise, surprise, surprise, is about the dichotomy of control. <laughs> right? And the, the way we suggest people do the exercise is actually to, uh, you, you can do it mentally, but it helps if you actually do it on paper with paper and pen or on, on our computer just draw a uh, spreadsheet or a table with two columns up to me not up to me and then whenever you face something let's say a job interview right start writing down as many things that you think are up to you on the left column and as many things as you don't think are up to you on the right column just writing them down is very helpful because it focuses your attention on oh Right, that's yeah. right. There's this that is up to me, and it's this, and, and, and so on. And then what you need to do is you go back to that list. And on the yeah. one hand, you focus your attention on the left side of the list, things that are up to you, because that's where your agency actually is efficacious. And on the things about the right, on the right side, you repeat to yourself some kind of mantra that says, This is not up to me. I'm okay, whatever things happen. So, for instance, let's take the example of a job interview, right? Uh, what is up to me? Uh, putting up the best resume possible for the job, preparing for the job interview in the best way I can, uh, showing up for the job interview on time, being properly dressed for the job interview, not going out uh, with my buddies and <laughs> drink the, the night before because that interfered with my, my sleep pattern and, then, and therefore with my uh, performance. What is not up to me? The outcome of the interview. Uh, whether the other guy, the, you know, the guys who are interviewing me it likes him, likes me or not. Uh, whether I actually do fit the job in reality as opposed to what I think uh, I do, uh, what the competition is, all of those things are not up to me, right? And so you, you approach things very deliberately that way. And initially, it's difficult because it's natural to get focused on, yeah. on the outcome. But the more you do it day by day, you know, even with very small things uh, you know, in your day-to-day -day life and then working out to the, the big ones, then it kind of becomes ingrained, becomes a second second nature. Yeah, I really like that idea too, because I think it just puts so much, I think when we focus on the things that are out of our control too, we end up just really not doing things to make it better or to improve the outcome because we get focused, we get kind of get distracted by things and it just right. sets us off course. I want to actually, if I could ask you a question about our relationship to externals, because one of the things you mentioned in the, I think it was theme one in the updates, was this idea that externals don't need to be despised. And you given it, you, you suggest sort of ranking, um, putting virtue on top and then ranking, you know, these things and recognizing that some things are still good. We can, you know, we can seek them, I guess, to a certain extent. And we just right. remember that virtue is the only thing of value. Um, do you think that, I mean, I think updating it makes a lot of sense. And I really like this idea. I was just curious if you think that there is the risk that, you know, if, you know, say a Lamborghini or something, because I think you use that in the example, right? if that's one of the goods that I recognize, is that, is pursuing that or even getting it, is that getting in the way of virtue in some way, do you think? Or is it, how do you yeah. handle that sort of question? No, that's a, that's a very good question. So first of all, let me give you a little bit of background about the despising stuff. So both Epictetus and especially Seneca use often uh, the, the words to the, to the effect that you should despise externals, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, but in fact, that's really not the Stoic position. Uh, even if you go back to the early Stoics, Zeno and Chrysippus, those externals are not to be either despised or loved. That's, the, that's why they're called preferred indifference, right? <laughs> or dispreferred <laughs> indifference. They are indifferent, meaning that they, they don't affect your, uh, your virtue, right? So having a Lamborghini or not having a Lamborghini yeah. doesn't make me a better person, right? Or a worse person, for that matter. It's just it's morally neutral. That's the meaning of the word indifferent there. 
It's indifferent, not in the sense you don't care or you don't give a damn. It's indifferent in the sense that, okay, so if you have money or you don't have money in your <laughs> bank account, that doesn't make you a better person or a, or a worse person. What makes you a good person or a bad person is how you use that money. So it kind of the, the other way around, right? It comes from yeah. within. It doesn't depend on the external. Now, let, let me go back, however, to your question about the Lamborghini and you know, it does it get in your way. I would argue it does. And in fact, uh, even Seneca clearly argues that it does. He didn't know anything about Lamborghinis, but, <laughs> but he knew a, a thing or two about wealth. He was actually a wealthy person, a very wealthy person. Uh, so here's the notion. Technically, it doesn't matter as far as your as a stoic circle, stoicism is concerned, how much money you have or how much how many goods, material goods you have, so long as A, you did not acquire those goods or or, or that wealth in an unvirtuous way, like you know, exploiting people or something like that. And B, <laughs> you don't use those goods or wealth in order to oppress people. So, so long as, in other words, so long as you act virtuously, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you are the poorest person in the world or the, the richest person in the world. However, Seneca, good psychologist that he was, says, yeah, that's in theory. In practice, <laughs> the more stuff you have, the more money you have, the more wealth you have, the more you're tempted to use it, uh, you know, incorrectly. And so you, undermine, you risk undermining your own virtue. He says, you know, if you were a sage, the ideal stoic, uh, practitioner, right? The, that you always make the right decisions, virtuous decisions. Then it doesn't matter. I guess a sage could be a billionaire. It doesn't really matter uh, because the sage always makes the right decision. But unfortunately, most of us are not sages. And, and so yeah. we kind of undermine ourselves that way. Let me give you an analogy. This is actually something that, uh, that there is pretty good evidence in modern psychology uh, that Seneca was onto something here. Uh, so modern psychologists will tell you that if you have a problem with some kind of temptation, let's say, uh, you know, you're a little bit overweight or your, your uh, health is not exactly where it should be, and therefore you should avoid certain kinds of foods, right? Let's say ice cream for one thing. Well, the best way to avoid ice cream is to skip the ice cream aisle at the supermarket entirely, just, just bypass it right? Say, oh, it says, <laughs> conveniently, it says ice cream over there. So you just say, okay, I'm going to go somewhere, somewhere else and not buying the ice cream at all. As opposed to buying the ice cream, putting it into the freezer, and then telling yourself, oh, I'm not going to eat it that much. I'm just going to go in there just a little bit. Once in a while, I'm going to treat myself. No, you won't, because now you have a constant <laughs> lure into your freezer, right? That, that, that thing is calling to you constantly and so you have to use your willpower every minute of your day that you're at home to resist the thing if on the other hand you use your willpower once say no i'm not gonna buy it then you don't have a problem because now if you feel the urge for an ice cream in the middle of the night you can't just get up and go to the refrigerator and open it you have to actually get dressed get go downstairs go around the corner that's a lot of work right and the more work you put between you and something you want to stay away from the more likely you are that you, to stay away from, from it. The same goes with wealth, possessions, and virtue, right? If you say no to uh, extravagance, to, to uh, luxury, and a, a Lamborghini would definitely qualify as luxury, right? Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong in wanting, in having a car if you need it. I don't have a car, for, for instance. I live in New York City, and I have not owned a car since 2006, which is when I moved here. Uh, and that's because I don't need it. It's, it's superfluous. I take the subway and walk around all, all, all around. Um, but of course, I've also lived in places where you could simply not live without a car. You couldn't get around. Yeah. You couldn't get grocery shopping uh, you know, without a car. Yeah. So it's fine to have a car that's an external possession. And it's fine even to have a car that you like. I mean, there's no reason to go for the, you know, the lowest rung possible. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a fine line. And I think we all know deep inside where that fine line is between something that is comfortable and you can afford easily and you can you know deal with and all that and then moving across that line and going into luxury Seneca says once you go you cross that line into luxury there is no stopping point right so if you for instance say okay I'm going to buy a certain number of uh, you know pairs of shoes that are 
enough for me to walk and have a sufficient variety. You know, you don't want to use only one pair of shoes because that, uh, uh, you know, might not go for every occasion or for every yeah. type of weather and everything. But what do you need? Three, four, five, fine. Once you start aiming into the 15, 20, 100, then there is no stopping point, right? Because now you've gone so far beyond what you actually need that every time you see a pair of shoes that you like, you're just going to buy it, right? That now you stepped into luxury. And even though the luxury itself doesn't undermine your virtue, it makes it more difficult to practice virtue because now you are, in fact, as you were saying a minute ago, Daniel, you are distracted. You're, 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 now your focus is not on improving yourself and making yourself a better person. Now your focus is on, hey, I should get the latest uh, model of iPhone or, hey, I should get, you know, for instance, in terms of, you know, uh, smartphones, uh, for years now, my policy has been, I wait until the new model comes in and I buy last year's model, which has the practical consequence that I save a lot of money. For one thing, because yeah, you know, yeah. once a new model is out, the old model is cheap. <laughs> they, they, they just sell yeah. it for cheap. It, it is still a really, really good piece of technology because it's only a year old. It's not like it's not like I'm getting, I'm getting something ancient. But at the same time, I, it's a way for me to moderate myself. It's like, do I really need the latest model? No. Why? 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 It, it's it's a phone. It works perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, it does everything that I want. And so I don't need to go with the latest model and spend more money and so on and so on and so forth. So I can, instead of obsessing about, you know, competing with my friends about, hey, I got the latest camera and, you know, the latest blah, blah, blah. I said, I don't care. I just got this thing because it works. I really like that too, because I think so many people struggle with that, especially in the society with the, you know, with consumerism and stuff and always wanting the next thing. Sorry, did you want to jump in, Randy? Well, on the same line, so the, we, we kind of play games with consumerism, like I have better than you have. And you mentioned in the book how uh, the only games worth playing are games that you can win. And one of the best <laughs> games you can win is living a better life. So I was wondering from your own personal life, do you have any practices or any uh, advice more than you've given us already about the phones uh, for things that have actually helped you kind of pursue a better life? Yeah, there, there's a number of exercises that I do on a regular basis. As I said uh, a few minutes ago, I wrote, uh, co-wrote a book that has actually 52 exercises. And, yeah. and not, that, not that we suggest necessarily we regret that, that people should do all 52 of them. <laughs> Although we have. We, when we were writing the book, we actually went through each exercise and tried it out. And these exercises are all called from the ancient sources. They're all based on Epictetus, Seneca, Musonius, Rufus, and Marcus Aurelius, mostly. Those are the, the four big ones. Uh, but they're also updated to modern science. I, mean, I, I am a scientist as well as a philosopher, so I like to th for things to be evidence-based, as they say. Right, so we, we checked with modern psychology, <laughs> uh, psychological literature and said, you know, does this thing actually work? That, does, it, does it actually, is there evidence? Is there reason to think that this thing works? <laughs> but of course, out of the 52, I am my, prefer my preferred ones, and I have some, a smaller set of exercises that uh, I do on a regular basis. One is the one that I mentioned a few minutes ago, the economy of control. Uh, you know, which I do either in writing, as I explained it, or, or just mentally. Sometimes Now I, I've been doing it for so long that it's just mental. It's like, okay, what is under my control? What is not <laughs> under my control? For instance, give, let me give you an example. Uh, in the middle of the, the pandemic, early on in the pandemic, uh, my, my wife and I were living here in Brooklyn, and uh, all of a sudden the refrigerator breaks down. Not good, because that <laughs> meant, uh, you know, you, that we had to go out grocery shopping every day which has obviously increased the, the chances of exposure to the virus. And this was before the vaccines were out. Also, it, uh, you, know, you can't buy produce, fruits, and stuff like that. So you tend immediately to eat stuff that is less actually healthy for you, right? So canned foods and stuff like that. So I, I still remember this very clearly. You know, we just looked at each other as soon as we found out that the refrigerator was not working. And the first thing that came out of our mouth was, okay, so what is up to us here? Right? <laughs> And we made a list of things. So the first thing is we called the management company uh, of the building and we said, you know, can we get a new refrigerator delivered? And they said, no, we don't allow, at this moment, we don't allow delivery of larger plants. Okay. Uh, well, do you allow delivery of small things? Yes, we do. Great. So we did some research on the internet and we found a good, uh, you know, dorm type refrigerator now, which was delivered two days later. Now that's not ideal, 
but at least it does still allow you to get some fresh fruit and produce and put it there for a, for a yeah. few days. And then, of course, we also switched our priorities in terms of grocery shopping. We went for foods that are less perishable, you know, that sort of stuff. So that was it. Instead of getting upset about, ah, oh, damn, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And now the, the refrigerator breakdown is like, what, what good does that do, right? So the first thing is the dichotomy of control. But some of the, my other favorite exercises include, some of them are about consumerism. Um, one of them is based on this story that is sometimes told about Socrates, that he was uh, going through the Agora, uh, the Athenian marketplace, right? In, middle, in the middle of the city, where there were all sorts of things for sale. And he was walking by with his friends and he went through the, whole t- the entire thing from one end to the other. And then he, he told his friends, you know, I didn't realize there were so many things I didn't need. So he didn't <laughs> buy a single thing. It's like, so that an- inspired an uh, exercise that can be done in a couple of ways, an anti-consumerism exercise that can be done in a couple of ways. One of them is, I call it the walk through the mall. So pick a yeah. shopping mall very deliberately and very slowly go through all or most of the outlets, take a look at all the merchandise, don't buy anything, of course, get to the other side and tell yourself exactly what Socrates uh, said. It's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know there were so many things that I didn't <laughs> need. Now, I have to do this almost every time I travel because I don't know if you notice, but airports uh, lately <laughs> have these, are built in this way that you have to, especially international airports, you have to go through, yeah. you know, uh, you know, a bunch of shops um, before, before you can actually uh, get to your gate. And it's like, uh, so I do it deliberately. I just slow down. I look at things <laughs> and I get to the other side. It's like, look at me. I haven't bought anything. The other way to do it is f- for people to shop online. You decide, you you mark your calendar on Monday morning. You say, okay, for this entire week, I'm not buying anything at all, except for foods and, you know, basic necessities, stuff like that. Just nothing. See if you can do it for a week. And it feels so empowering because by the end of the week, it's like, wow. First of all, again, you save money. And second of all, you are beginning to react against this insane idea that uh, is typically American called retail uh, therapy. Right. This notion that if you feel down, you feel you know depressed or anxious or you know things are not going well. Oh well, yeah. I got just go out and shop. Okay. That will make you feel better. It's like what? That that's the equivalent of uh, oh you feel bad, therefore go out and get some junk food, which people do. A lot of the reason you know they call it comfort food yeah. uh, <laughs> because it makes you feel better. Yeah, I know, but it also ruins your liver and your blood pressure and your cholesterol and all that other stuff. Yeah. So. So that's one uh, other exercise that I do on a a regular basis. A good one also to do is uh, something that is inspired by Marcus Aurelius' meditations and is sometimes referred to as the sunrise meditation. And this actually predates the Stoics. It goes back to the uh, Pythagoreans of the 6th century BCE. In fact, Marcus tells us that we should do as the Pythagoreans used to do. And that is, um, at least once in a while, set up your alarm clock, a little before sun, sunrise, get out, get a cup of coffee if you need to, then get out and go to a spot where you can see the sunrise. Now in the city here in New York, it's not that easy, but you know, <laughs> you, can, you can do it. And, and just stay there. Just, just wait until the sun rises and then uh, look at the, at the spectacle of the sun rising. Of course, do not look at the sun straight, <laughs> obviously. I should go without saying, but just in case. Now, why would you want to do that? <laughs> because especially, you know, the majority of the world population these, at this point lives in cities. And people that live in city have a uh, rare opportunities to commune with nature, to remind themselves that we are, in fact, a part of a larger cosmos. As the astronomer Carl Sagan used to say, we're literally uh, stardust. The, yeah. the molecules that make up our bodies were actually forged inside a supernova that exploded billions of years ago in the vicinities of the solar system. And now how is that going to make any difference to your, to your day-to-day life? Well, because it gives you a perspective on your problems. Once you, if you spend like half an hour looking at, at a sunrise, or if you can't get a sunrise, go to a sunset, right? Um, you have reminded yourself that there are bigger things out there, that, that these things, that there, there are, astronomical phenomena that have been going on for literally billions of years and that your 
particular problems, issues, or whatever they are. Certainly, they are important to you, and certainly you need to take care of them. There's no question about it. But you know, in the big scheme of things, they're not really that important. And so it helps putting things in perspective. This notion, sometimes uh, uh, a similar meditation is called the view from above, right? And again, this comes from Marcus, where he, ta he tells himself like, oh, so you're having this problem. Do you imagine that nobody else in the history of humanity had this problem, right? Um, now, what would you want to remember, your, remind yourself that other people have had the same problems? Because that way, it kind of demystifies the problem, right? I mean, there's a reason why, for instance, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, some of the best-selling books, other than, by the way, Marcus Aurelius' Meditations that shot up uh, in the you know, best-selling territory uh, during the pandemic. But other than those, you have Albert Camus' The Plague, <laughs> Philip Roth Nemesis, uh, Boccaccio's The Cameron, what are, what are these, uh, and, and uh, John Paul Sartre, No Exit. What do those, these things have in common? They're all about plagues. Right? They're all about surviving in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> and so now you would say, you might say, well, why people, they live in a pandemic. Why the hell do they want to read about a pandemic? Well, because you remind yourself that other people from time immemorable have been living through these kind of situations. And, you know, many of them actually got through them and and that, so they are inspiration they, they kind of it kind of normalizes the situation it kind of says you know this is not the end of the world it's an unpleasant situation it can be more than unpleasant for for some people of course it can be deadly for some people for that matter but it this kind of thing has been going on before and it will happen again and so we just need to accept that one of the things that is outside of our control is whether there is a pandemic or not but what it is under our control is how you act in the middle of a pandemic. How do you, how do you deal with the situation? That's very much up to you. I really I actually really, I like those a lot. Those are really interesting and helpful. I really like the last one too, because I think it does. It's, it's nice. It kind of reminds you too, that, you know, it's just like looking at other people as an example too. It's reminding yourself right. that other people have done it. You can also do it. And that this is your experience is not so unique because we love to tell exactly. ourselves that all the time. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's never happened to anybody. It's like, yes, it has. Yeah. yeah. It's almost nothing that has a, is going to happen to you <clears throat> that it hasn't happened to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Did you, want, did you have another one, Randy? I, I figured we were going back and forth. Oh, okay. But... Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, one of my other ones was just in general, like, um, you know, I think this, this idea of updating philosophies is really crucial because I think there's this tendency to kind of think of things as stuck, you know, um, or as, you know, the original is being somehow like perfect and that we can't change it. I think right. you need, you know, obviously it needs to adapt the times you, you point out at one point, you know, that we've made moral progress. We think differently and that we shouldn't, you know, necessarily read this the same way. Um, in, in your mind, how do you envision sort of a, a redo or a, an update of stoicism as as not deviating too far. Do you see a point of which they might go too far? Or do you think that there is, so is there something core to it that's necessary that needs to stay? I was just curious. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and I, I think the same question applies to other philosophies or religion, oh, yeah. right? So to, as I said, nobody's a Christian today as they were 2000 years ago. But at the same time, if you don't believe that Jesus is the son of God and <laughs> you know all that sort of stuff, <laughs> then why, why would you call yourself a Christian, right? Uh, go, go, go someone else. Uh, I think the same goes for stories. Is yes, there are things that can be tweaked and some of them are more than just tweaks. Some of them might be significant uh, changes and updates. Uh, but at the same time, if you reject the notion of a dichotomy of control, for instance, or if you reject that the notion that the most important thing in life is to work on your virtue and becoming a better person, or if you reject the notion of cosmopolitanism, then why, why bother calling yourself yeah. a stoic? Right? Then, then fine. But there is no sharp line, I think. Um, and in fact, the ancient stoics themselves knew it. First of all, we have evidence from, stoic comment from commentators on the stoics, for instance, Diogenes Laertius, that the ancient Stoics themselves disagreed about all sorts of things. Uh, you know, Cleanthes, the second head of the Stoa, had disagreements with Zeno, the first head. Uh, Chrysippus, the third head of the Stoa, had disagreement with both Cleanthes and Zeno. Posidonius, one of the middle Stoics, had disagreement with Chrysippus, Cleanthes, and Zeno. So it's like, you know, this, this was going on from the beginning. It, it was never meant to be uh, set in stone. Not only that, but we actually have a an explicit uh, uh, 
point by Seneca in one of the letters to Lucilius, he says, remember, my friend, that the people that preceded us are not our masters. They're just our teachers. And if we find new ways to do things and better ways to do things, it, we ought to do things better. We don't have any, he, he, he continues, he says, we do not have a monopoly on the truth. New generations will discover new truths and it will be okay to follow, you know, good in fact, not just okay, but good to follow new truths. So, so this is right built in into Stoicism from the beginning. <clears throat> in my mind, that's one of the things that differentiates religions from philosophies, right? Now, even though religions themselves do change over time, they change not by design, but by necessity, right? Yeah. Uh, because you have sacred, sacred scriptures, right? If you disagree with the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, or whatever sacred scripture, you're in trouble because you're literally disagreeing with the word of God. And God is supposed to be infallible. So, you know, there you are. There you have it. But if I disagree with Epictetus or Seneca, nobody's going to excommunicate me. You know, yeah. there's no, it's not like I'm going to hell because I disagree <laughs> with Epictetus. Epictetus was a man, brilliant man. I think he was as close to sagehood as, as one might possibly get. But nevertheless, he was a human yeah. being who was in part, of course, inevitably the result, the product of his own culture. And so, for instance, let me give you a specific example, which is one of the, those that I uh, discuss in the, in the field guide to a happy life. So on the one end, Epictetus in particular and the Stoics in general were ahead of their time in terms of treatment of women. Uh, Epictetus, Musonius Rufus, who was Epictetus' teacher, Seneca, all explicit, Zeno, all explicitly say that women have the same exact uh, moral abilities and intellectual abilities that you, that that men and therefore they should be they ought to be taught philosophy they ought to practice philosophy you know that that for the time was a fairly unusual position it was not unique to be fair to the epicureans epicureans yeah, also yeah. were you know uh, friendly to women but it was still very unusual it was way ahead of their of their time but at the same time you find epictetus uh telling his students not to be you know feminine when they if they if they don't <laughs> you know, if they don't do the right thing. And Seneca says, you know, don't behave like a woman, uh, you know, in, in the thralls of your emotions, you know, that sort of stuff. Now, that language is the result of the fact that these people were ancient Romans, right? Yeah. They, you, you just couldn't avoid it. <laughs> and that was the culture of the time. Uh, and yeah. so it makes no sense to me, uh, to some people, you know, going back like 2000 years and say, oh, look at that. They were sexist because they were, well, you're using modern standards, projecting them back 2000 years. That makes no sense. What you need to do, the, the proper way, I think, of looking at what people from other er eras or from other cultures have done or written is to pick the best of what they've done and give them credit for that and ignore the worst <laughs> or because because the worst is the part that you know why would you focus on the worst i mean the worst is part of what they were doing at the time this this was like background you know the the cultural background uh, of the time and you know one thing that slightly annoys me when when i hear people say oh but epictetus was sexist or something like that it's like dude just be careful because you seem to think that that we reached the pinnacle of human yeah. morality, right? That that's it. We're, we're the sages, and then we can we can actually criticize anybody else. It's not like that. Just wait three or four hundred years, or five hundred years, or a thousand years, and see what people will say about you and, and what you've wrote. Um, yeah. If, of course, you're going to be lucky enough that people are actually going to bother, uh, you know, talking about you five hundred years down the road, which most likely they won't. So like, you know, slow down. A little bit of humility <laughs> here is, is in, uh, uh, in, in order. Just pick the best of what people have been writing and saying across cultures and across times. Why would you want to pick the worst? Yeah. What is the point of that? Other than indulging in this exercise of superiority, which I think is fundamentally misguided and very unwise, <laughs> among other things. Uh, so I'm actually curious. Uh, Looking at it from another way, if an ancient Stoic was to come to life nowadays, what do you think their perceptions of our world would be? Or what do they think, what would they say that we need to focus on? That's a good question. So obviously they will be bewildered by our technology, right? I mean, you, you give a <laughs> smartphone to Seneca and you say, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> what is this thing? 
But other than that, I don't think that would be very surprised. I mean, one of the reasons that Stoicism and other ancient philosophies like Buddhism are still practiced today and they're still relevant today is because we haven't changed that much. Yes, our technology has changed dramatically, but we as human beings, we still want the same things. We still dislike the same things. We still go after or try to avoid the same kind of things. I mean, if you read Seneca, sometimes he he's just just comes across as your neighbor uh, because like there is a letter to uh, Lucilius where he says, where he complains about the noise coming from the street downstairs and he can't write, he can't focus because there's a lot of noise in the streets of Rome. And I say, yeah, that's right. That's what <laughs> happens outside my window in the streets of New York. It's the same thing. So, so they would not be surprised at all to see that many people are still uh, pursuing externals, thinking that that's where happiness comes from. They still they wouldn't be surprised by knowing that we still have war and famine and poverty and all that. Those are the same problems that they were talking about uh, 2,000 years ago. I assume they would be a little disappointed by the fact that humanity hasn't made much progress, <laughs> but you know, that's outside of their control. So it is what it is. I, I like that too, though, because it also like <clears throat> it humanizes them too. Right? It makes them relatable in a way that we can understand. Because it's you know we all, all are dealing with the same problems and have been situations and circumstances that might change somewhat, but it's still there. And I think that's why they're also still relevant. So so relevant, right? Is that and like you said, I like that of picking out the good things. That's what matters. Um, <clears throat> do you want to add anything? But I think we're almost out of time. But I like I kind of like that point as an ending point because that's a really good one to go check out the book and and read it. Well, thank you for joining us. It's a field guide to a happy life, 53 brief, brief lessons for living. I can highly recommend it. I think Randy can as well. Thank you for joining us, Massimo. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, we'll be back later with another episode. Thank Take you care. very much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.